Let me start by saying congratulations on the movie. Uh, you guys did such a great job with the script, and I wish I could talk specifics today, but that will be for another day. Um, I would imagine that both of you are in a very unique position right now that people want to, you know, they want to hear your ideas and what you want to work on. I've been asking this of a lot of people recently. If you could get the financing to make anything you want, what would you make and why? Oh, man. I mean, the truth of it is, like, sort of, like, making a film like Last Night in Soho is the thing that you get made. Is like, I mean, in, in a weird way, like, sort of, you know, like, after I did Baby Driver, you know, which was my biggest hit worldwide by quite a long way, you know, that's that's the time when you sort of get a passion project off the ground. It's like, now's the time to make Last Night in Soho. Because I think, sort of, you know, in terms of, like, big IP franchise films, like, They'll, they'll never go away. Weirdly, that maybe the, not, not necessarily that, like, um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I feel like that the making original movies when you have the opportunity should always be the sort of the, the first port of call if, if you could magic a project into existence. That's not to say that I would never do a franchise film <laughs> and I'd not be dumb enough to kind of put that on record, but, but in, in a weird way, like, something like this was, like, something that if... if if I could get something made, th this was the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I, something original would be my preference, or the next night in Soho, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you go after this one. I mean, we have no sequel ideas. <laughs> right. um, this is one of these... You Thomas and Mackenzie's been through enough, no sequel. Yeah, no more for her. <laughs> Chrissy, if I'm not mistaken, you worked as a barmaid in London earlier in your life. And I'm curious, what would people be like surprised to learn about working in the, as a barmaid in London? I, well, I mean, I actually worked as a bartender in the bar that's in the film. And I, I'm, I'm briefly in the background of the film. You see this arm, but nothing else because I can't act. Um, yeah, just, just this arm's an extra. Um, I think what you'd be surprised about with that bar in particular and, and, and in Soho is that, you know, Soho is the, the sort of, the showbiz district, it's the entertainment hub, it's where all the post houses are, um, but it's also like full of brothels. And, um, and and a long time ago when I was working at that bar, there used to be a dominatrix that worked across the road and we used to get to sit and watch her clients come in and then she would come in and tell us everything about her clients and we would give her vodka um, and ask her to stop telling us stories. But like that kind of thing, is it's just such a, it's a world where the you know the dark side and the light glossy side are, are separated by like a hair's breadth yeah i've walked around soho a number of times and it is you can just feel the history as you're walking up and down these streets um edgar can you sort of talk about where where did the germ of this idea come from and did it come from a drunken bender in soho <laughs> um well i think actually what you said is exactly it, is actually the 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 I think there's two types of people that walk around any, any city that has history. It's people who walk around and don't think about that at all. And probably people like yourself and me and Christy who, who can't think of anything else. And I think that's something that really was like the sort of the, the, the key sort of seed of the idea was, you know, you see buildings that are 400 years old in Soho that have seen so much history. And I sort of a big believer in the idea that like, um, if not actual ghosts, the idea of like psychic residues left behind, like the sort of the residue of an event. Like there's a line in the movie where somebody says that like in London, somebody's died in every room, in every building in this whole city. I believe that. Yeah. And like, so, you know, I can't help thinking about that um, in, in a city like London. And, you know, London's one of those places as well where the ground floors change, like all the restaurants and the clubs on the ground floor change. But as soon as you look up to like one like story higher and look towards the roofs, you see like the sort of the old buildings and you're sort of much more aware of like the, the you know, that these these places have been here for hundreds of years and, and the shadows of the past like loom large. So that was like one of the key kind of like um, inspirations for the movie. Uh, Edgar, you are obviously a very talented screenwriter. Um, and Christy, obviously you are also a very talented screenwriter. And I'm curious how you each complemented each other in the screenwriting process. For example, did, you know, 
did someone come up with an idea that the other person would have never thought about because of your different perspectives on life and the way you write? Well, I think um, it's sort of two parts to that. I think sort of we, um, I had written the story like quite a long time ago and I'd sort of been sort of, sort of gearing up to try and make it. And, and the first thing I did was, was hired a researcher to sort of research every single part of the movie in in a real way so that you know in a way that like Eloise is kind of trying to sort through her perception of the decade versus the reality and, and that's sort of also what I had to do in terms of I had this idea for the story and it's like well let's research it properly and when Christy came on board um it was through actually Sam Mendes introduced us and said that we would get on like a house on fire which we did <laughs> but it was when Christy mentioned that she worked in Soho and lived above um, Sunset Strip, a strip club on Dean Street. I was like, I had this idea for this movie and I want to run it past you. So we went on a kind of like a tour of uh, Soho drinking haunts and I basically, like I was around the campfire, I pitched Christy the entire story. But one thing I say, and I'll let so Christy from her perspective, is that there was that thing in terms of like just A, wanting to write with Christy and B, just like our own sort of shared history of the neighborhood and obviously like hers very different from mine as well that that was all going to inform the story one thing i would say is that i had the outline for the movie but one one key thing that like where you say did they somebody else suggest something when i like went through the whole plot with christy and when we first started writing together physically when i asked her to write the screenplay with me is i had originally envisaged the 60 sequences as being silent and being like sort of you know, like dream sequences where people didn't speak. And Christy was, you know, said to me, I think you have to, if you need, if you're going to fall in love with Sandy, like Eloise becomes obsessed with Sandy, you need to like meet the character. And it was like one like simple change, which kind of then I think in a great way, just like affected the whole movie. And also for me, like then was the sort of key to sort of some of my favorite sequences because writing all of the sixties dialogue was like, a real sort of challenge and a joy at the same time. So that's something that Christy suggested that I hadn't previously thought of. Um, I mean, like, I think a really good collaboration, when you get to the end of it, you're not quite sure who came up with what, because it's, like, so kind of gone back and forth and become so enmeshed. So, like, I'm not quite sure what's what would be mine and what would be yours, because it's just, it's you know, it's a team effort, not just from, the like, the script, but, like, the entire crew. Um, but what I must say is writing with a very talented writer director like Edgar Wright is kind of wonderful I mean it's exceptionally wonderful because when you're trying to work out how these sequences work and you know a lot of the like the in-camera trickery that we do or that they do um is so beyond me occasionally he would show me clips on YouTube and he'd be like like something like this kind of movement and and like magic tricks and stuff like that and I'd be like I understand but I did not understand <laughs> and even <laughs> even when I was on set I was still like is this happening who's the wizard is there some sort of cgi going on here and it wasn't and so like stuff like that and understanding like the vision the pace all the music the tone of the story i mean that's all this very talented man here uh one of the things um did you guys actually write with any thought of actors in mind or do you not do that at all i mean i guess there are some like people like certainly like the character that St Terence Stamp plays when you're writing, you're thinking, I can't think of anybody better than Terence Stamp to play this part. Interestingly, in the role of Eloise, uh, Anya was always in mind for that part because I had seen her in 2015 in The Witch. I was on the Sundance jury that year and I, you know, we gave Robert Eggers Best Director. I saw her in The Witch and I was like, and, and at this point, the so as I call it the Soho film or the Soho project, it existed only as like the outline and like the research, but I was like, she needs to be in my Soho film. So I met Anya for coffee in LA and I ended up telling her the entire plot over coffee and she was like, oh, that sounds wild. I want to be in that movie. So I said, well, when, as soon as I write it, I'll let you know. Then over the next three years, I would run into Anya every now and again and I started to feel like the boy who cried wolf because she must have thought I was like a crazy person. It's like, oh yeah. Edgar Wright with his Soho film that will never come to pass. So anyway, when we then started writing in 2018, by this point, Anya's been in several other movies. 
you know, I'd seen her kind of like sort of mature on the screen and like play parts in like Split and Thoroughbreds. And then as we were writing and, and sort of as a, as, a, as a nature of the Sandy part expanding and, and seeing sort of Anya like sort of like kind of like, you know, kind of like, uh, like blossom like a butterfly on the red carpet. I was like, and, and you know, just one of those people who looks like she could fit into any era. I was thinking, huh, maybe like Anya should play the Sandy part. Like she sings, like we now got a singing scene in the movie. Maybe Anya is the sixties part. So when we finished the script, I sent her the draft, first draft, and I said, "Okay, plot twist. I'd like you to read Sandy and not Eloise." And luckily, she said, "I love the script, and I would love to play Sandy." So we sort of wrote it with Anya in mind, but for the other part. Okay, so one of, the, one of the things that I think the film does exceptionally well, and hopefully will stay connected, is that it keeps the audience off balance the entire time. Like, you're constantly wondering exactly what's going on. How does that work in, in, in the script stage in terms of writing that sort of off-kilter feeling? Or is that sort of established also in the editing room where you're, you know what I mean? Can you sort of talk about that? I guess that's established in the script, it's not something that we're kind of finding it in the edit. I think sort of in, in a way like, you know, me and Paul Matchless kind of edit on set. So we kind of like sort of like you use, you know, do, sort of constructing it as we go along. But but I, I think that was always the idea with the movie in terms of like, you know, you're, you're, you're what to me an interesting thing about it. And this kind of informs the entire movie. And this doesn't give too much away. But like, I always like the idea of the dream sequences in the movie being like having like ellipses between them. So you're getting like a story, but you're not getting the whole story. You're getting little glimmers of this story. So there's a moment in the sort of like from one dream to the next. It's not really clear whether uh, with Matt Smith and Annie Taylor Joy story at one point it's like, is this the next night or is this like nine months later? It's not entirely clear. And also because Thomasin, uh, Eloise, uh, played by Thomasin McKenzie, she doesn't have that information either. She's only, like, getting kind of, like, literally these little kind of, like, shards of somebody else's life. And then so she has to sort of piece it together from this kind of, like, um, experience that she's had. I mean, there's a scene in the movie where she, she goes to the police. I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. But when she starts to say out loud what her perception of the plot is. It obviously sounds completely absurd, as it would be if you went to see a police officer saying, okay, so this is happening. And, but, it, but that's her reality. And so that was a fun thing for us to write because you're seeing the film through the eyes of somebody who has a power that other people can't comprehend. And obviously people like think that, you know, that she's like sort of maybe like losing her marbles, but we as an audience know that she isn't. Yeah, I, I actually love that scene because it's what someone might actually do in that situation. It's not playing, you know, it's treating the... Anyway, that's a that's a thing. But uh, I am curious about the editing process. You know I love talking about it because it's the final rewrite and where it all comes together. How did the film change in the editing room in maybe ways you weren't expecting? And how much did you end up losing with, like, deleted scenes and other things like that? I think there's a couple of things. There were a couple of scenes that we cut out. Like, there was a couple of scenes that we cut out even before we showed it to an audience. And after we did one test screening, there was, like, a big scene which we eliminated. And and usually with those things, it's like, you know, people talk about, oh, is there anything you wanted to keep in? It's like, no. Like, usually when you take a scene out, it's like an amputation. It's like, sort of, like, you know, this foot is diseased, and as soon as you cut it off... Um, it's like you immediately feel better and it's like that scene is never going back in. It's just like sort of, it's better, it's better without it. What we did have with this is that when we, we did some additional photography post pandemic, not post pandemic, mid pandemic, we were supposed to do some additional photography the week of the shutdown. And so we basically had to kind of go home for like seven months and we were one of the first films to come back and shoot in the UK so there was, there was a, um, a week in late July where the only films shooting in the UK were Jurassic World and Last Night in Soho, both shooting at Pinewood and also very surreal experience because, a very emotional experience because everybody was so happy to be back at work. People were sort of nervous about how is this 
how is filming going to work in a COVID area uh, era? Like, and so we were having to kind of navigate that, but also you really felt that everybody was so happy to be working. And actually in a way, like we, we knew what we wanted to do, but like six months off kind of informed some things where you can really kind of nail down what it is you want to do. So in some cases it was about kind of like adding bits of storytelling to make things kind of like work in a slightly different way. And there was one like deleted scene which in included like a key line, but I hated the scene and I wanted to get rid of it. So then it was like, oh, we're going to write a new scene to replace this one. And it's going to include the line that we need from the scene that's been gone. So just that stuff where, listen, this is, a, you know, listen, a lot of people kind of treat reshooting as somehow a negative thing. If it's like studio mandated and something is like testing badly or you know, and, and the filmmaker is doing it against his wishes. But pretty much in everything that I've done, when I've had the opportunity to do additional photography, it's usually to refine the storytelling. Not in a dissimilar way to the way they make an animated movie. You know how the Pixar films are made, you know, or how like Phil and Chris make animated movies. Is that you're constantly like rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. So we had to one attempt to do that is like, how can we, in, it, 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 there's an opportunity here to make some bits a bit more succinct or a bit more emotional and to some sometimes go in and redo just little parts of scenes, you know. And I actually think the sort of the stuff that we did here, like, was so kind of seamless that even when the studio watched it back, they were like, was that scene in there before? <laughs> like, um, they were sort of, uh, like, so impressed by the continuity of what we'd shot, of, like, putting little things in that, like, weren't previously there. And, and it's amazing, you know, I always find that, that it, it's amazing what how you can change things because it becomes, like, the butterfly effect. Is usually, like, if you do a test screening and something's not working, people say, oh, it doesn't work, cut it out. And you say, no, oh, it's like me and George Miller were talking about it it's like referred pain it's like you know the pain might be in this shoulder but actually the acupuncture needle wants to go in this shoulder so it's that thing where so that's where editing and actually that process of showing to an audience is an interesting thing where it's like if you change this it actually affects something like 45 minutes later it's interesting you bring up the additional photography because I think that it, additional photography has a bad stigma with some people but it's all about the context of the additional photography, as you said, whether it be studio demanded or filmmaker, it's like three days could make this movie so much better. Absolutely. I think it's a thing like sort of like when it's when it's talked about in a negative way, people call it reshooting. But filmmakers who would kill for an extra couple of days call it additional photography. <laughs> um, what are you really excited for fans to see with this movie that perhaps they're not getting or they haven't seen before or haven't seen in a long time? Well, I think, you know, cinema in itself is transportative. You know, cinema on the big screen is transportative. Like, and this movie, you know, you get to go on a journey with Eloise's character. Like, the main takeaway I've had from people who've watched the movie have said, wow, I really feel like I, I went, on a, went on a journey with that character and had a real experience. And so, I guess because, like a lot of my other movies, like, the lead character is in every single scene. So you've really, it feels hopefully very experiential, which, you know, to me is like the best of cinema is like that, that you go on a journey with a character. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, get off your couch, go and get sucked into someone else's life for a change. <laughs> like, you know, I've spent so much time at home during the pandemic and just being back in cinemas and getting to, you know, be transported away. That's, that's what I hope people get and that they're thrilled. And scared. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely listen. I know that it's not for everyone going back to the cinema right now with the pandemic, but I will say that the use of color and the editing and the filmmaking on display in this film is something that, like, it just screams cinema, you know? Oh, thank you. I mean, I think the thing is as well, I know sometimes it's controversial, like, where people say, like, if you're saying you have to see this on the big screen, I think for me the key is we want to give people the opportunity to see it on the big screen. That's the important distinction there. 